morning, friends. Welcome to worship here at the Montrose Methodist Church. I am Lisa, I'm the pastor here, and today we're actually looking at Epiphany and the baptism of our Lord, which means we're looking at the wise men, but also at Jesus' baptism in the Jordan. Friends, I hope you'll stick around. We've got a great worship set up for you. Welcome to worship. Oh 
Good morning. What does love look like? How do you know when someone loves you? Sometimes they tell you words, and sometimes people might show that they love you by their actions. Today's scripture involves both speaking love and showing love by actions. Our Bible passage this morning is about baptism. What does the word baptism mean? When someone is baptized, it is a sign for everyone to see that he or she belongs to God and to the church family. When people are baptized, they are saying that they are responding to how much they are loved by God and how much they love God. It also shows that the baptized people promise to love others by the ways they act. When we see someone baptized, we remember our own baptism. We also remember our promise to pray for and support those in our church family. We are reminded of God's love. John the Baptist came before Jesus and prepared people for him. He knew Jesus was the savior of the world. He told people that they needed to follow Jesus. John was the one who baptized Jesus. When he dipped Jesus into the water and lifted him back up, a dove came down and landed on Jesus, and a voice was heard that exclaimed, I love you. It wasn't the voice of John. It wasn't the voice of Jesus. Do you know whose voice it was? That's right, it was the voice of God. Everyone was silent as a voice boomed from the sky This is the son that I love. I am pleased with him. I love him. The word love reminds me of a holiday that is fast approaching. Do you know what holiday that would be? That's right, it's Valentine's Day. Throughout the next few weeks, we are going to learn about God's love for us. Have you ever seen those little candy hearts with words written on them? Each week, I will have a different heart to remind us of the week's word. These hearts are called conversation hearts. Each week, we will have, a con- we'll have conversations around the words on these hearts. Today, our candy heart says, love you. This is a reminder of our baptism, when God claims us and tells us we are loved children of God. We are also reminded that we can show love of God to others by our actions as well. From today's scripture, I wonder why John was silent during the baptism. I wonder why Jesus was silent during the baptism. I wonder why they were both silent, but it was God's voice that perhaps matters most. I wonder if you ever hear God's voice speaking to you. I wonder what God is trying to tell the church. Each week for our prayer, instead of praying hands, we will shape our hands like hearts to remind us of love. Can you place your hands in this position? Please join me for a moment of prayer. God of love for all people, remind us through candy hearts, shaped hands, actions, and our words to others, how much you love us. Amen. A reading from Psalm 29, verses 1 through 11. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forests bare. And in his temple all cry, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. 
The Lord blesses his people with peace. Friends, let's take a moment and go to God with our prayers. As always, if you would like to have us pray with you and for you, please contact our church and we'll be in prayer with you. Almighty God, we come this morning into this new year, not knowing exactly what to expect, but being sure that we will go with you. Lord, we ask that you show up for us, that you be with us and that you make yourself known. As we remember the kings who showed up, who knew who Jesus was before so many others. As we remember Jesus' baptism, for John knew who Jesus was before maybe even he did. As we remember that you call and you claim us, help us to say yes to that call and claim. Help us to recognize that each of us, just like Jesus, are your children, your beloved. You say, I love you to each of us. Would we open our ears to hear you, Lord? Help us to do so. Lord, we ask that you continue to be with those who are suffering from the Marshall Fire, those who have lost homes and so much more. Help us to reach out and be your hands and feet and voice of compassion, to not only give monetarily, but to show up, to collect, to be the hands and feet of Christ. Lord, we ask that you continue to push us forward this year, that no matter our resolutions, you are with us, and that we remember one step in front of the other can move us forward into being what the world needs, which is to be reminded of your grace and your kindness. Help us to be that this year, no matter what else we resolve to. Help us resolve to be kind, loving, and compassionate individuals. That all this would be done through your Son, our Christ, whom you called and you baptized in the Jordan and you sent your Holy Spirit to be with and in, as you do, Lord, with each of us, as we come together and we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the kingdom and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Luke from chapter 3, verses 15 to 16 and 21 to 22. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Friends, it is good to be back with you today, and I want to say thank you to the Reverend Dr. Derek Weber for heavily influencing today's sermon, and for each of you for allowing me the last couple of weeks off. Last week was communion, 
This week is baptism, and next week is, well, next week. Marsha McPhee has affectionately called this time in one of her sermon series and worship series, Bread, Bath, and Beyond. And so next week, we will go beyond. But this week, this week is a mixed bag Sunday. Epiphany. Twelfth night, the celebration of the kings, was just this past week, in the middle of the week. They finally arrive and they tell those in the house, because it was a house and not necessarily the manger in which we think they arrived to, probably later they found a toddler, but they tell those the prophecy about the star and the specialness of this child. Who knows if those gathered in the living space, maybe it was a living room littered with toys, they were watching Jesus run from lap to lap, who knows if they completely understood what they were being told, what they were hearing, that these astronomers came and said, we saw a star, we followed and we came. The epiphany that Jesus was who God says he was. Today, we also celebrate the baptism of Jesus, which was not as an infant or a toddler or even as a teen in the temple, but much later as an adult. Jesus was probably 29, maybe even 30 years old at this point, and this too was an epiphany. The heavens open and the Spirit of the Lord descends like a dove, and a voice claims and calls and says, I love you, to Jesus, for all to hear. This is the second of the three epiphanies that border this liturgical season of epiphany. We are in this season until we get all the way to Lent. We begin on epiphany with the wise men who saw the star. They were given an epiphany, a revelation, about who this child really was and was to be. Not the son of a poor girl and her husband who couldn't find room at the inn, but the savior of the world. The first Sunday of the season and the last Sunday of the season, the last Sunday after Epiphany, contain two revelations that also identify Jesus as God's son. So we begin today with baptism, and then we end with transfiguration, that misty mountaintop experience where Jesus is transformed before the disciples. And this year we get the Gospel of Luke's version of events, which leave a lot of details out, details that Mark and Matthew thought were important. The actual baptism here is not nearly as prevalent as the after events. The verses that we skip serve to usher John the Baptist off the stage in favor of Jesus, who now begins his ministry. But after John's bluster, the next thing that we know is that the baptism has already taken place. We missed it. But we do that sometimes, don't we? We come for the show, and by the time we have got to our seats after finding parking, it's already happened. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized, that's what our text says, darn it, we missed it. You'd think that if Luke had a clue about the struggle that the church has had over, oh gosh, centuries, about the detail of baptism, well, that he might have spent a little bit more time talking about it. Was Jesus immersed, poured over his head, sprinkled? We don't really know. According to the Gospel of Luke, the way in which Jesus was baptized wasn't important. We don't know which liturgy John prefers or if the vows that Jesus made were the same as the ones that we make today in this church or other churches or not. We don't know if John was properly credentialed or if Jesus followed the rules. We don't know who signed the certificate either. Okay, let's be honest, there was probably not a certificate. We think we need to know all of these things. We think these things are importantly or important, but probably it doesn't matter. 
Luke also says, Jesus had also been baptized. That's the sum total of the description here. If Luke is saying that the methodology isn't what is important, then what is? Why is Jesus even there in the first place? What's the question that has puzzled biblical scholars since the beginnings of the church? That question. John was preaching a baptism of repentance. But if we know that Jesus was without sin, why was he even there? Why would he need to be there? The other interesting thing is that the next verses in Luke's third chapter are the genealogy of Jesus. Since the gospel writers never do anything just for the heck of it, or we don't think so, we have to ask why is the list of Jesus' earthly family tree following the story of his being claimed by his heavenly father? Why is it there? Here is the leap that I'm going to ask you to make with me this weekend. Jesus went to John to be baptized because he was entering into this messy world that we live in. He was the same man taking on a new role. He was the son of God claiming his call in the world. All of us are born into a world not of our making a world we can barely understand, sometimes at the best of times, a world we can't explain at the worst of times, a world that needs repentance, that needs grace. We all need to understand the grace of God. Jesus walked into the river to be buried up to the neck in the sin of the world and then to rise to the Spirit. He didn't approve of the brokenness of the world or the hurt that we inflict on one another, but he embraced it. He made it his and he carried it with him like a chip on the shoulder, like a pack on his back. He carried it all the way to the cross. He lived in this world. At the beginning of each year, I tend to make resolutions, sometimes small and attainable, but I usually tell you about them. We tend to hear or say things like, new year, new you, and we believe that this year is the start of something amazing if we only could do that one thing or change our habits or do something different. We would be a new us. But what if we take a cue from Jesus this year? New Year, same you. Give yourself some credit for the amazing things that you do and that you are. You are involved in a faith community. I mean, you're here. This faith community that is always looking for new ways to serve the community at large and the world. You are here in worship, expressing your gratitude to God. You are breathing in deep breaths of life that allow you to say things like, I love you and I care about you to others that are around you and in your life. You are beautiful and wonderful. New year, same you, keep it up. Because just like Jesus, we are set into this messy world and we too often take on the disappointment of others, the hurts, hardships. We empathize and we sympathize and we carry all of the hard. So maybe, just maybe, this year, we are gentle with ourselves and we let Jesus carry those things. And we resolve to continue at whatever slow and steady pace we need to, to continue this journey of faith. Asking questions, doing really good work, being the kindness that we know the world needs and offering forgiveness and grace to the hurting and the shame-filled that are around us. After Jesus was baptized, what did he say? I'm a whole new person. No, I think it was, I'm now the Messiah that you have all been waiting for. Oh, wait, no. Jesus, when he embraced all that is wrong in this life, all that is less than divine, less than holy, 
didn't say a thing, didn't try to give meaning or understanding or explanation. Jesus was silent. Did he want to speak? Or was the weight of the burden that he accepted so heavy that even he was dumbstruck? Like us, Jesus was silent so that he would know what we experience when we have no words to say in the face of death or despair. There were words spoken in that moment, though, words that echo in the silence of our moments, even to this day. They weren't his words, or ours, or any human words. They were God's words. And they said simply, I love you. They were words of affirmation, not for deeds done or not done, but for being, just being. I love you. Words to hear in the midst of darkness, words to cling to in the midst of doubt. Words of the living and the dying. We hear and then by grace speak these words. They are all we have. I love you. Friends, we have some homework. If you have made resolutions or set goals or not, I want you to think about how you can embrace and love yourself this year. What is the most generous and loving thing you can do for yourself this coming year? I know that in loving ourselves well, we in turn love the world around us well. So I leave you with my friend Nadia Boltz Weber, her words that she says yearly, her reminder, and then some. She writes, as you enter this new year, as you pack away the Christmas decorations and get out your stretchy pants, as you face the onslaught of false promises offered you through new disciplines and elimination diets as you grasp for control of yourself and your life and this chaotic world, may you remember that there is no resolution that, if kept, will make you more worthy of love. There is no resolution that, if kept, will make life less uncertain and allow you con to control the pandemic and your children and the way that other people act. So this year, may you just skip the part where you resolve to be better, do better, and look better this time. May you give yourself the gift of really, really low expectations. May you expect so little of yourself that you can be super proud of the smallest of accomplishments. May you expect so little of the people in your life that you actually notice and cherish every small, lovely thing about them. May you expect so little of the supply chain and the service industry that you notice more of what you do get and less of what you don't. And then just tip really well anyhow. May you expect to get so little out of 2022 that you can celebrate every single thing it offers you, however small because you deserve joy and not disappointment. So I wish you a happy as possible new year. Friends, I love you. Amen. This baby boy who came to earth to bring us joy But you don't have to think it's true now, do ya? The angel said 
Friends, as always, thank you for your faithful giving. Thank you for continuing to commit to give to the work of the church so that we can continue the work and ministry of Jesus Christ here in Montrose and around the world. I want to let you know that you were so generous during our Christmas and Advent season. We were able to give several thousand dollars split amongst our staff and also we'll have a total for you next week where we were able to send to the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR to Hurricane Relief and Tornado Relief and also to Shepherd's Hand here in our community. Today I want to let you know if you would like to help with any of those who have been affected by the fires here in Colorado, the way is to go ahead and write a check to the church and just write Marshall Fire in the um, in the memo line or call our church or go to our website. Uh, we will make sure that any help that you are able to give gets directly to our conference so that we can help those who are affected by this massive fire, who lost homes and lost so much more. Friends, thank you for caring for one another and for showing the love and kindness and grace of Christ to all of those in need. Thank you for helping us do this 
good, good work for caring for one another. Friends, I want to extend an invitation. If you have not been baptized or would like to be baptized, if you would like to reaffirm your baptism, I invite you to give me a call or send me an email. In the United Methodist Church, we do not re-baptize, but we definitely affirm baptism. And we have rituals and rites that we can do with you. Friends, baptism is a calling and a claiming. It is us saying yes to God because God always calls and claims us, no matter where we are in life. We get to just say yes. We get to accept the Holy Spirit, and we get to hear God say, I love you. God says it all the time, and sometimes we're just not listening. Friends, I hope that you will engage with all the things that we have going on here in the life of the church. We have a family ice skating event. We have a decades potluck group coming up. We have a women's retreat coming up. We have so many things that we'd love to see you at. So please check out our website and join us for any of those occasions. Friends, as you go from this place into this new year, be reminded that you are loved and that there is no resolution that if kept or broken will make you more or less worthy of God's love for God loves you as you are. Friends, go and change the world.